Welcome to This View of Life, where we take a deep dive with the best and brightest thinkers on anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. I am your host, David Sloan Wilson. For more interviews, articles, videos, and special publications, search for This View of Life on your favorite search engine. Hello, uh, this is David Wilson for Evolution, This View of Life, the magazine that approaches anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. I am delighted to be talking with Peter Gray, who is pioneering the study of education from an evolutionary perspective, has had a blog on psychology today for uh, several years, and has a new book, uh, Free to Learn, which is uh, published by uh, Basic Books and came out just a month ago. So welcome, Peter. Glad to be here. And Peter, we go back quite a long way. I'm very familiar with your work, and I've always loved it. So happy that you've written written it up in book form. And tell our audience, what is this book about? And uh, how is it that evolution provides such a new perspective on the topic of education? Well, uh, you know, I'm looking at education really as a biological phenomenon. We are the educative species, if you will. We're the species that depends upon culture to survive, you know. Um, And um, so we somehow have built into us this capacity to become educated. And so I've been interested in the question of uh, what is it that's built into us and how does it work and how do we become educated? And it it leads to um, something quite different uh, from what most people would think of when they think of education. Most people, when they think of education, think of as schooling, which is something that um, the society and adults uh, do to children um, as the way of educating them. But when I look at education as a biological phenomenon, I see that education is something that children do themselves. Uh, We have been a cultural species, a species in which each generation has had to acquire the values and skills and lore and so on of the previous generation. Um, we've been we've been that kind of a species for a long, long, long time. And during all but a tiny portion of that time, it has always been children's responsibility to educate themselves. They look around, they see what it is that people do in their culture, and they play and explore in ways that they become uh, good at the uh, at the kinds of skills that are important to their culture. So that's the uh, the thesis of the book. Basically, is that children come into the world biologically prepared to educate themselves. And then the the book elaborates upon that. What is this preparation? Does it work just in hunter gatherer cultures, or does it work in our culture? So it didn't have to be that way. It could be that when we look at other cultures, including hunter-gatherer cultures, we find adults teaching children much as in modern schools. But uh, uh, what you've shown is that's not the case, basically, that uh, in uh, traditional societies and especially hunter-gatherer societies, um, it is it is the case that, that children are in charge of their own education. So just fill that in a little bit for us as to exactly what the facts are about uh, about uh, how culture is transmitted in in, in hunter gatherer cultures, cultures. Yeah. yeah yeah well it's very interesting i i did a survey of uh, anthropologists who have studied uh, hunter gatherer cultures actually among these different anthropologists they've studied seven different hunter gatherer cultures on three different uh, continents, um, and I've read whatever I could uh, about uh, um, hunter-gathered cultures, especially those people who've written it all about childhood. And what seems to be consistent from culture to culture, there just doesn't seem to be any exception to this, is that in all of these cultures, the adults believe that children learn by observing, by playing, by exploring, And indeed, the children are allowed, and even adolescents, by the way, when I say children, I'm including teenagers, too, are allowed essentially infinite time to play and explore because the adults believe that's how children learn. There's also a general um, 
belief in hunter-gatherer culture is that each person's will is very, very important. So hunter-gatherers in general don't tell one another what to do, and they don't tell children what to do. Uh, they, they are strong advocates of individual autonomy, interestingly, at the same time that they're strong, very strong advocates of sharing and cooperation. So we've got this interesting combination of autonomy, sharing, cooperation. These are the values of the it's culture. A, it's actually very libertarian, isn't it? It's very libertarian in a sense. That's, it is. That's right. Except perhaps maybe the the uh, the real focus on complete sharing. You could also say it's communist, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, they share everything within the band and even across bands. Um, very great deal of great deal of sharing and cooperation. So the uh, children are growing up in this environment, and they are playing and exploring, and they're playing in a, at at the activities that are important to the culture. They are also, through play and exploration, acquiring the um, social and um, emotional characteristics that are essential to be a successful adult in a hunter-gatherer culture. And one of the cases that I make is that in play, when children play independently of adults, they very rarely play competitively. Adult, we in our culture tend to impose competition upon children's play. When I observe children play, even in our culture, and they're not being influenced by adults, they're rarely competitive. Even when they're playing pseudo-competitive games, they're not playing in a competitive way. When children are playing, the main goal of the play is to keep the play going and to keep, because kids want to play and they want to they want to play with their friends and they don't want their friends to leave them. So when you're doing that, you have to treat your other playmates well. You have to you have to see from their perspective. You have to take into account their needs. If you try to bully them, they'll leave you. Play then seems to be I social play seems to be an ideal situation for learning how to share and cooperate, learning how to see things from the other person's perspective. I mean, the, the fundamental freedom in play is freedom to quit. So if, if you and I are playmates and I'm bullying you or I'm not taking your desires into account in any, any way, you're just not going to play with me anymore. But I want to play with you. I have this strong drive to play with you. So therefore, I've got to learn to be able to pay attention to your needs as well as my needs. Well, there's no more important skill than that for a hunter-gatherer person to learn because they, the entire culture depends upon this enormous ability to cooperate and share and be, in a sense, in the minds of other people, to know what's going on in, in the other person's mind. So and, that, little... and children are constantly practicing that in play. So let's talk a little bit more about bullying. I can imagine lots of our listeners saying, gosh, you know, can it really be true that this is, this sounds like the Rousseauian vision of the noble yeah. uh, savage? And, uh, and is it, uh, does bullying take place in hunter-gatherer societies? Uh, these are, the kids are off by themselves. What's prevents the, what prevents, what stops bullying from taking place? And, and why should bullying be such a problem in modern life if it wasn't a problem back then? Yeah, that's a really good question. From what I hear from the anthropologists, I, let me make it clear again. First of all, I have not myself lived in a hunter-gatherer culture or observed. So this is all based on what others have told me. And I've asked these kinds of questions. And the what I hear from anthropologist after anthropologist is, who bum these observations is that they just don't see bullying. And um, I think that there's a number of reasons for it. One is that the culture is, they're growing up in a moral culture that does not approve of bullying, does not approve even of any kind of domination of one over another. Egalitarian, the egalitarian view is very prominent. And I'm sure that the children growing up in that are acquiring that kind of the ethos. They're just growing up in this kind of, a, of an environment where this is the morality. Secondly, I think that the fact that the play is age mixed plays a huge role here. When children are, first of all, keep in mind, a hunter-gatherer band has only at most about 50 people, more normally about 20 or 30 people, um, including children. 
So there's only a certain number of children to play with, and they're over a certain age range. Even if you wanted to segregate by age and just play with kids your own age, there's not enough to play with. So you're playing over several years of age. And there's a lot of reason to think, not just from these observations of hunter-gatherers, but from research that I've done in this culture and research that some others have done as well, that the presence of young children brings out the nurturing instinct in, uh, in people, in, in teenagers, in older children, as well as in adults. And that that plays a role, I'm, I'm quite sure. And also, you know, when we segregate children by age, and especially when we do them in an otherwise competitive environment, such as in the school situation, where it's kind of based on competition, you're supposed to outscore other people to get the higher grade. Um, when we do that, we're almost setting up conditions for bullying. And these are abnormal conditions from a human, from the perspective of what's a normal human environment. We did not evolve in a world where children were ever segregated by age. So you're putting kids in an abnormal environment that is, almost seems to be conducive to who can prove whom to, who, who can prove that they're better than someone else whether they're better by being smarter or they're better by being tougher or better by being able to beat up the other person. It almost generates a competitive situation. So, so um, I know and you know that there's actually modern examples of this kind of education working. And so please tell us a little bit about the Sudbury Valley School, which you know so well. Right. Um, and maybe other models that are out there, which indicates that this is something that could actually work in a modern context. Yeah, well, well the Sudbury Valley School is a school that's uh, not far from where I live. My son uh, attended there as a student long ago. He's actually a staff member there now, so I'm familiar with the school in that way. And I've used it in some ways as a base for my own research. One of my doctoral students did his doctoral dissertation based on more than 100 days of uh, observations at the school. Um, and and um, this is a school that's been in existence for 45 years. So this is not a new school. It's got hundreds and hundreds of graduates. It accepts students from age four on through high school age. Um, and basically, I would say that the school didn't set itself out to model a hunter-gatherer band, uh, to be the equivalent of a hunter-gatherer band for our society. But when I look at the school, I see enormous similarities in philosophy. The, well, the it, was people, patterned, it was patterned after the New England Town Hall, right? It, it, it was really patterned after the, the, the people who founded the school were really believe in American democracy, participatory democracy, the town hall version of the town meeting version of democracy. And they believed that for children to develop as democratic citizens in a democracy, the most important thing is that they develop in a democratic environment, community, where they have the opportunity to really experience the rights and privileges of democracy, to vote on issues, to make their own decisions about their own life, to associate with whom they please, to speak freely. All these rights that we think of as, uh, as American democracy, the school was founded on the basis of that. Well, the result is that this is a school where children are not told what to do. There are rules, but all the rules are made by school meeting at which everybody has a vote. And none of the rules have to do with education. Children are deemed to be responsible for their own education. Um, and so if you go there at any given time of day, there's about 140 students ranging from age four on through about 18. And um, if you, the only thing you knew was that this was a school, you would assume it was recess. Kids are playing in all sorts of ways. They're outside climbing trees, uh, fishing in the pond. Um, they're inside reading books. Some of them are playing, many of them are playing on computers, not surprisingly in our culture. Uh, but they're doing all kinds of things, but they're clearly things that they have chosen to do themselves. Some of them look a little bit more schooly and some of them look less so. But they are, uh, you, what you don't see is classes, what you don't see is adults telling kids what to do. And uh, yet, so this is a school that seems to violate all of our society's assumptions about schooling, that uh, 
here we have kids not taking tests. There are no tests. <laughs> There's no curriculum being given to them. My first study of the school long ago was of the graduates. Wow, what's going to happen to these kids when they graduate without school? Can they go to college? And lo and behold, they can. <laughs> and they, and uh, about the same proportion go to college as uh, from the local public schools or the local private schools, a high, very high proportion. But the school doesn't necessarily think that college is the is the purpose of what they're doing. And many of the students who don't go to college are among the uh, among the most capable ones, and they've chosen careers or uh, that that don't require college in order to pursue them. And none of these kids believe they have to go to college to learn. There's so many ways to learn in our culture. So the um, so the, at any rate, the, the study of graduates proved to me that um, that the the school works as an educational institution. And then I got uh, interested Peter, in how me, does it me, work. Uh, let me break in. Uh, uh, these students, when they decide they want to learn something, they often do seek adult instruction for certain things. Is that right? And for example, if they want to go to college, they do, they have to take the SAT test in math. At that point, they might approach an adult. Am I right about that? Absolutely, yeah. They, they uh, In fact, that's one of the situations where quite a few students will approach an adult. They realize that they need to take the SAT test and Math and verbal isn't much of a problem. They all seem to be big readers and they require big vocabularies and so on. But the math, you know, there's a certain amount of algebra and geometry and trigonometry on the math that you don't learn in just in the course of life. So they um, prepare fairly specifically for the math SAT. And of course, there are some kids who've gotten interested in math much earlier and, and they generally don't need any help for this. But there are some kids who've decided to go to college and they have never, ever studied math and they will ask for some help. And what is fascinating to see is that in this situation where the kids are, you know, 16 or 17 or 18 years old and they have decided for that they need to learn this math to do well on the SAT test so they can go to a competitive college, they can learn it very, very quickly. You know, something like a the person who often teaches this uh, little course says it's basically about six weeks long of about an hour contact time, <laughs> and they do some homework in between. And in that period of time, they can learn the math that they need to study the SAT prep book, which they can then do pretty much on their own because these prep books are pretty good guides to learning the very specific kind of math that you need to do the SAT. Now, Peter. Um... And this is such a fascinating topic, and uh, and uh, we've been involved in workshop activities and so on. And so we both know that there's another sort of theory of education from an evolutionary perspective, which is that the knowledge needed for modern life is so different than ancient knowledge that our minds are essentially not well adapted to learn this modern stuff, and that therefore it requires different educational techniques. Uh, uh, something much more like road learning and much more like what modern education uh, looks like. And David Geary, our colleague, is uh, um, one of the uh, main proponents of this um, of view. It's often called primary and secondary knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, makes perfect sense from an evolutionary perspective. Could be true. Right. Uh, it's a matter of, of, of uh, doing empirical research and letting the chips fall where they may. But let me ask you to, to comment on this other theory of education from an evolutionary perspective and and uh, what's uh, right and wrong about it if anything yeah it's a good a very great question the you know when you think of it it's it's it, without the empirical finding it would seem quite logically plausible that the hunter gatherer our hunter gatherer ancestry led to educational instincts in children that were great for learning what hunter gatherers needed to learn learning how to hunt learning how to gather learning dances learning the music learning all the various things that you have to learn there's an enormous amount of learning to be done by the way to become a competent hunter gatherer but hunter gatherer cultures are don't have uh, have written word and they don't have generally don't have numbers beyond um, oftentimes one two and many so they don't the three r's are lacking now of course schooling is uh, first and foremost in most people's minds about the three r's 
And so it makes some sense that an evolutionary psychologist looking at this would say, oh, well, no wonder kids have difficulty learning the three R's. Why, no wonder we have to uh, teach them all of this in school. Um, this is not part of our evolutionary heritage. This is not something that comes naturally to the human mind, unlike maybe spoken language. So, but the empirical finding is when at Sudbury Valley and I would say at many other places besides Sudbury Valley. I mean, first of all, first, first of all, there's always been kids who, before they ever start school, <laughs> learn how to read. Who knows how they learned how to read? They picked it up somehow, you know? Nobody deliberately taught them. My own son could read when he was three. Nobody taught him. We didn't teach him to read. We had a lot of reading going on in the house. He kind of saw reading is a thing to do, much like a hunter-gatherer child sees hunting and gathering is a thing to do. He got interested in it, he paid attention to the words, he maybe asked a few questions, and lo and behold, soon he was reading. He, he was also read to quite a bit, so reading was part of his culture. Well, the kids at Sudbury Valley are in an environment where people read, they see older kids reading, just like in a hunter-gatherer culture, they see older kids playing with bows and arrows. So, so the empirical observation is, not just at Sudbury Valley, when kids are surrounded by people who read and write, and when they're surrounded by people who do numbers and use numbers, and when they're in an environment where it makes sense to use numbers, they pick it up. They, they, they pick it up because it's part of the environment. And I, I, it, there's a lot of reason, there's a lot of evidence that basic literary skills depend more upon your home environment than upon the school that you go to. And that's because in your home environment, that determines whether reading and writing seems to be a real thing that real people do in real life. The Sunbury Valley School provides that kind of environment. No matter whether reading and books are a big part of your home, here you see people reading. You see books, you see people playing games, and you join games that involve numbers and, and calculations. You get involved in activities such as cooking in the kitchen where people are cutting recipes in half and so on and so forth. So you're learning fractions. You're learning these things in the course of life. Um, so that's the empirical finding. Now, if we go back and ask about the theory, you know, it's a, it, this, this is more speculative, but when I look at, um, when I try to understand what hunter-gatherers are actually doing, they're doing a lot of abstract thought. Yeah. You know, tracking itself requires, uh, you know, the, the descriptions of tracking uh, are, are just amazing what hunter-gatherers can do. They're using tiny traces in the, in the sand or tiny bent twigs. And they're looking at things like, did a certain centipede cross over this track? And knowing whether this centipede is, uh, is a creature that um, moves about at a certain time of day, and whether it's crossed over the track or under the track of the, of the antelope that they're tracking, they're taking into account enormous amounts of information and making de deductions based on that to decide whether how, at what time of day did this animal move by. They can, they can figure out an incredible amount. Through, so in the process of doing this, I would argue they're using many of the same cognitive processes that are essential to doing what we consider to be abstract thought that's involved in mathematics or symbolic kinds of reasoning in our culture. So I don't think it's so completely new to humanity. Well, one of the things that sways me on to your uh, uh, position is that uh, if you want to find the hunter-gatherer mode of education, uh, it's graduate school. Yes. It's graduate school where the formal courses fall away where you as an individual learn from people that you select, where young graduate students learn from older graduate students and postdocs, at least as much from their professors, and right. everyone takes their own next step. And so it seems that the right. most advanced form of education is, is like the hunter-gatherer form. And right. uh, I think that that's, for me, is one, one uh, um, compelling reason. But of course, it's a matter of the it's a matter of uh, doing the research and, and letting the chips fall where uh, where it um, where it may. So, Peter, let me ask you uh, just a couple more questions to round out this interview. Uh, how do we implement this kind of education, um, especially 
it seems so radically different. Uh, is it po can you imagine this becoming more widespread? And can you imagine achieving it incrementally? So starting with a public school education, standard public school system, can you imagine incrementally working towards a more enlightened form of education? How can this be done? Yeah, I, I've given a lot of thought to that. I don't think it can be done incrementally in the sense of gradually changing our schools towards a little bit more freedom, then a little bit more, and a little bit more. The way I see it occurring really is, is uh, by more and more people leaving the current school system and going to a different, an entirely different kind of school, such as a Sudbury school. There's an increasing number of such schools. There are also many people who are leaving school to do unschooling, what they call unschooling. They're taking charge of their own education at home. And, and many of the people who are doing this are setting up community, they're setting up learning centers where kids can come together and they're creating something that's a little bit like a Sunbury school. That's the way I see the change occurring. I don't see it as occurring incrementally as long as we have the notion that teachers are responsible for children's learning and that we have to measure children's learning, then it's very hard to, it's very hard to make the other changes because, because as, as long as we have the notion that you have to measure children's learning, then we have a curriculum to teach <laughs> and we're going to try to teach towards that measurement so that there's evidence that the teacher is actually doing his or her job. And, and the very act of testing, the very act of giving a curriculum undermines the child's sense that this truly is my responsibility that to educate myself. So I think it kind of has to be all or not. I think that um, I think there are some things you can do within the public school system to make things better for kids. I'm all for those things, but I think ultimately the change will come not from within the system, but from people leaving the system. You know, as you know as a as an evolutionary biologist, um, Evolution requires variation, you know, variation and selection. That's why top-down, centralized systems often fail, because there's not a lot of different experiments going on to see which ones work. I'm all for having really freedom for all sorts of schools to develop <laughs> and, and let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> you know, let's see what appeals most to people. And so I, I think that uh, if I were looking for social change, I would not try to be the czar of education that turns all the schools into Sudbury schools. I would say, let's open it up. Let's allow people who, to, to start whatever schools they, kind of, they like. And uh, it's even possible that some kinds of schools will work better for some kids and others for other kids. But I think in the end, in this kind of a system, this is my prediction, is that most people would end up choosing a kind of school where their kids are free because they would see that it works and well, because the kids are does, happy. I mean, there's a real sort of a quandary here because this does require a certain kind of monitoring. It's, it's not as if there can, there can be no monitoring because then you don't know what works. If you hadn't done your studies at the Sudbury Valley School, then mm. we wouldn't know that it works as well as we do. On the other hand, there are some kinds of monitoring, such as the performance monitoring that's t taking place ever more in public schools, which seems to be highly destructive as a form of, of monitoring and really interfering with that which is trying to improve. And so somehow we need to do the right kind of monitoring. They let those thousand flowers bloom, all those different ways of teaching, uh, of teaching and an appropriate kind of an assessment which doesn't kill what it's trying to, to improve. I don't know how to solve that quandary, it's a, well, but it's not a simple task. Well, it's an interesting question because it really is founded on the basis, what is an education? What is it that you want to monitor? And I guess in my view, I would say that an education works if the person develops into an adult who is happy, productive, moral, <laughs> you know, doesn't get into trouble with the law, uh, is, uh, is, uh, and is a good person to other people. 
So that's the monitoring I would do. But, you know, the other people might have a little different version of that. But when I talk with most people, I say, you know, what would you hope for for your child? What really do you hope for for your child? They'll give me something like that. They, You know, nobody hopes that their child will, that their fondest hope in the long run, if you ask them to really sit back and think about it, to really sit back and think. Nobody says, my fondest hope for my child is that he will get the highest score on the SAT test. <laughs> my fondest hope for my child is, nor even will people say, if, if you allow them to reflect, that my fondest hope for my child is that he will get into Harvard. If you allow them to really sit back, they will say, my fondest hope for my child is that he's happy, that he's a good person to other people, that he is able to support himself, things like that. Those are the criteria I would look at to see if the educational system is working. When we use those criteria, our current educational system is very often failing. Yeah. Well, let me ask, uh, end with two questions. They're a little bit devil's advocate questions. One is the individual differences. So uh, it's not the average person that goes to a Sudbury Valley school. It's taking a by a sample of some sort of another. And let me ask the question, you know, what kind of student goes to Sudbury Valley School? Is it the kind of student that just has such a great family environment that they're going to succeed anywhere they go? And what would it be like, do you think, if you actually did take a random sample of children right. and sent them to the Sudbury Valley School? Do you think they'd all thrive? Or is this kind of education perhaps better for some types of individuals than others? I, well, I think that there are some people who wouldn't thrive, but, you know, for example, a person who has, uh, who's fairly far out on the autism spectrum would not do well there because the school is not set up to provide the kind of, of instruction and help that that person needs. But for a child who is, who's within the normal range of ability to learn socially, paying attention to other kids, wants to get along with other kids, picks up language and so on and so forth. I believe that I don't think the school works just for people of some personality types, and I certainly don't think the school works just for people who come from a certain home background. And I think the reason for that is because I think that this, what the school does is it supplements, it provides, it provides in a sense with quotation marks around it a rich home for children, no matter who they're, where they're coming from. Because for the kids coming from an environment where nobody's reading, here's an environment where a lot of people are reading, and so on. Now, in fact, who is it who goes to the school? It's interesting, I've really tried to examine that. Um, first of all, most of the kids, they're not coming from other private schools. These are not, this is not a private school population. This is not a prep school type of population. These are kids who are coming, if they've been to another school, it's almost always been the, the local public school or a local public school because they come from distance around. Why are they coming? Often they're coming precisely because they weren't doing well in the public school. They were failing or they were rebelling or they were, they certainly, many of them would not have been regarded as the cream of the crop by the public school system. So, um, so, so many are coming for that reason, but not all of them. Some of them are coming because they're, their sibling came who was having difficulty in school, and they're not having difficulty in school, but once the sibling is there, it's pretty hard to have this, you know, one kid in, in the public school having to follow all those rules and the other kid being free, so you send them both there. There are some kids who come there right from the beginning because their parents believe in it. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> there are kids who come from a variety of, uh, of educational backgrounds. I mean, it tends to be, so it's located in a suburban area, it tends to be middle class people. And I would love to see the experiment done of kids from the inner city, from poverty neighborhoods coming to this school. So far, that experiment has not been done. There's a new school set up in uh, Philadelphia that's in uh, central, in the middle of Philadelphia that may. Um, Maybe the test that I'm looking for that's modeled after Sudbury Valley, but it's too early to say at this point. But I am, uh, I am quite convinced. Clearly, the public school system has failed to serve the needs of people from in poverty. Every once in a while, of course, there are you you hear about a child who who excels, who's come from a very impoverished background, who excels and pulls themselves up and achieves greatness. 
But those are the exceptions, not the rule. Um, the, for the most part, the school system seems to, ex every year in the school system, the gap, the so-called achievement gap between the those who are coming from a middle class and upper class background and those who are coming from poverty seems to get greater. So s schools as we know them are not the great equalizer. I think the Sudbury Valley type of school has the potential to be because basically, you go to this school and you suddenly have acquired a new set of of what you might call cousins <laughs> yeah, and aunts and uncles. The staff are sort of like aunts and uncles. They're not like teachers. They're people who seem to be real people and they care about you. And so you you kind of want to emulate them in some way that you see them as real people, people that maybe you could be like that person. And maybe you would want to be like that person. You see older kids and you see kids from a variety of backgrounds. You maybe have never been in an environment where people are reading and talking about books, but suddenly a lot of your peers are reading the Harry Potter books and talking about them, and so you want to read them. So kids are kids are really drawn to what the other kids are doing, and, and, and I think that it's important that a Sudbury school bring people in from diverse backgrounds. The more diversity you have in the school, the more different models, the more different kinds of uh, exciting things would be going on because kids are bringing in different sorts of skills and ideas and backgrounds from their different families. Um, so as long as as long as there was a diversity of students, I believe that the school would work well for basically any normal kid. And by normal kid, I just I really mean somebody who's not who doesn't have the kind of disorder that really very clearly represents brain disorder. Well, here's my uh, last uh, devil's advocate uh, question. Uh, so many jobs out there when you finish your schooling are of the, not of the creative sort, right? So, uh, so uh, you know, what's it like to work at a fast food restaurant or as a store clerk or as a, um, in an office where the work is highly repetitive or right. kind of the work environment is of that sort. And um, does a Sudbury Valley schooling prepare people for that kind of work <laughs> environment? Uh, but uh, are we preparing people to be like, you know, intellectuals? And, and right. uh, what's... Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. People go from the school on to all sorts of different careers. That was one of the things I looked at in my initial study that I did quite some time ago, but the more recent studies of graduates validate that. People go into the whole range. There are people who go into the crafts, people who go into music and art. There are people who, who start their own businesses of one sort or another. There are people, everything, some people who go into everything academia. You, everything you've mentioned so far is a creative activity. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, so they go into creative activities or they go into activities that can be approached creatively. And increasingly, as you know, we are becoming a world in which machines are taking over the non-creative tasks. <laughs> you know, we need creative people. We need innovative people. This is what businesses are crying out for. This, you know, um, the kinds of jobs that kids graduating from this kind of a school are are. Uh, highly prepared for are the kinds of jobs that are increasing in number. The kinds of jobs that they're not prepared for are those that are decreasing in number. We also know, we now live in a world where you can't depend on holding the same job all your life. <laughs> we don't have, you know, we don't have union protection. We don't have those old jobs. You get the job and you're secure all your life. You're going to do the same thing all your life. People all their life have to learn on the job because you may be changing jobs. You, you have to be thinking all the time. The ability to learn and the, the confidence that you're capable of learning, the, the, the feeling that you are in control of your life is becoming more and more a skill, an essential life skill in our culture. So in some ways, this is a little bit more similar to a hunter-gatherer culture <laughs> where yeah. you, you, you need to be... You know, the hunter-gatherer way of raising children is a way of raising children that accents individual autonomy and willfulness and sense of control over your own life. We went through a long phase of history after hunter-gatherer time where 
you know, we had um, where most people in one way or another were servants or slaves <laughs> and uh, or, or serfs in, you know, the survival depended upon obedience. It depended upon following rules and not questioning the rules. Our school system really emerged out of that history <laughs> as a way of teaching obedience and, te and indoctrination of a specific sets of ideas. Well, as a society, we are now beyond that. <laughs> We, we don't have a, we are aiming for a world where we're not servants and slaves <laughs> and, and serfs, uh, where we are kind of all entrepreneurs, if you will, in the sense that we're in charge of our own lives and we're figuring things out for ourselves. And that's a little bit more like the autonomy of hunter-gatherers. So it's not surprising to me that once again, this natural way of learning that accents your individual sense of willfulness and personal control decreases your willingness to just do what other people tell you to do, that this once again, I think, is going to be create the kind of person that's very much valued in our culture. Yeah, well, that's great. And that's a great note to end on. Of course, there's so much more to say, but I think this has provided a glimpse of just how paradigmatically different it is to take a, a, a huge subject, a subject that's so important for our society, education, and to rethink it from an evolutionary uh, perspective. And Peter, you've meant so much to me over the years uh, for, uh, for pioneering this, uh, uh, this perspective. It's a real pleasure to feature your work on evolution, this view of life, and to promote your book, Free to Learn. <laughs> Everyone should get a copy, and uh, this will begin a dialogue. Of course, there's a lot more that remains to be discovered, uh, but this is uh, uh, definitely uh, something that needs to be a big part of the uh, conversation. So uh, thank you, Peter, once again for uh, a great interview. Thank you, David. I've, uh, I've so much appreciated your uh, support and over the years. Awesome. Okay, we're signing off. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to This View of Life. If you like this podcast, you can subscribe in iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review to help others find the show. This View of Life is produced by the Evolution Institute, a nonprofit think tank whose mission is to provide science-based solutions for today's most pressing social issues in order to improve the quality of life. Learn more at evolution-institute.org. And if this view of life is important to you, then type TVOL1000, T-V-O-L-1000, to see how you can join the Darwinian Revolution. <laughs>